But just recently, California proposed a new law for a four-day to mandate, possibly mandate, four-day work weeks. We're seeing pilot programs in the United States and Canada for four-day work weeks. The signs that are all around us showing the agenda that these people have, the control that they're wanting, and their end goal. So these are, this is the worldview of these people. Always trace back to this spiritual agenda. He says that at the end of their agenda will be the whole world worshiping Lucifer as the true God. So that is their end goal. Welcome back to another episode of Truth Matters. Welcome, Mackenzie. It's good to be back with you, my friend. No, it's good to be talking again. And we have some very uh, pressing things, interesting things we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, and it's not on the lines that I think a lot of people will recognize. You know, there's a lot of headlines and um, prophecy concepts that people are well familiar with, but we're going to maybe look at something a little different today. We're going to look at the role that unions are going to play in the future uh, persecuting system, the f Satan's final uh, system. And I think a lot of people don't have unions on their radars anywhere. And actually, there's kind of this big push right now uh, with climate change. The IPCC just released a new uh, report that basically says we're out of time and we have to make radical changes yeah. and do everything we can, sacrifice everything we have to save the planet. Right. So before we get into the unions, uh, we just kind of wanted to run through a couple quick Bible verses to let people know what's going to happen to this world. Because... Uh, unfortunately, there's no amount of human effort that is going to change the end result of what happens here on earth. And we're going to be tricked into thinking that if we give up everything, somehow it will save the planet, which will lead to some utopia that uh, will have no poverty and no hunger and no poor. And, um, you know, we see Jesus said, the poor will be with you always. So all these efforts that we uh, will see from the UN, the United States, the papacy uh, will all um, be for naught. It will just drag everyone further down into um, poverty. One of the first verses we're going to look at is Isaiah 51, 6, where it says, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. And that's a big key because this world, after sin, is degrading. We're never going to be able to build it back up to what it was. The, the, the sin is just too strong. And not until we see that new heaven and new earth, the earth is going to wax old like a garment. Now we should be taking care of it. None of us disagree that we should take care of the earth. But we are not able to change this in the way that people are thinking that uh, they can force people to do so. Yeah, and for those who disagree with that concept that sin is somehow the main cause of why the world is uh, getting further and further into this desolation, uh, we'll look at the Bible verse that says, at, uh, when, at the coming of the Son of Man, uh, so will it be as in the days of Noah. And when we look at the days of Noah, it says that the imagination of the heart was evil continually. I mean, there wasn't a single thought that was going on in, in the hearts and minds of the people in the world at the time, that wasn't evil. And it's going to kind of trend back to this uh, same end result, except first time it was by water and a flood, second time it will be by a flood of fire. Um, second one is in Matthew 24, 35 that we're going to look at. Jesus' own words, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So here we have Jesus straight up saying, heaven and earth shall pass away. 
Uh, I don't think that's a figurative statement when we consider the other places where we see continually the idea that this world is going to end. It is This earth is not going to continue on regardless of what we do to try to stop that. And the fact that the earth is so sinful and needs a cleansing, God is going to take place in the earth passing away because he's going to be putting the plagues on this earth to wipe out the earth, to clean it, and then eventually clean it with fire. And then we'll have a new earth created. So God is going to take part in the final cleansing and ending of all the things on this earth. Yeah, and that may be a, a tough pill to swallow for people who don't believe the Bible record or don't think that this is kind of the end state of things, but it's actually a merciful and, and just end. Um when you look at, you know, just, just giving a common example, if you have a, a pipe in your home and it's so clogged and so dirty that it's backing up and causing a, a flood in your home, what are you going to do to that pipe? You're going to clean it out. You're going to do whatever it takes to remove all the gunk and grime and grit. And it, it's a, it's a, a very simple way of describing it, but that the earth is going to be so mucked with sin, that there is nothing good left to preserve except for when we look at uh, the seal of God, the 144,000, those types of things, it's the last righteous on the earth. We're not going to cover that today. But the, the earth, there's nothing left to keep. It's it's in such ruin by the time this this final state comes up. In fact, Second Peter 3, verses 10 through 12, in fact, we'll just look at verse 10 here. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Another reference to the earth is not going to continue on. It's going to be burned up in the end. So there's another reference referring to that time when the earth will be burned and cleansed. And this will be a cleansing that will be forever. The first time the earth was cleansed globally was at the flood, which we just mentioned. That's in the book of Genesis, where God covered the whole earth with water and washed it. And then, in the end, to end all sin, he will burn all the things that are connected to sin with fire to finally cleanse that, and there will be no trace of sin left on this earth. And one last reference we'll use is Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So the idea that the uh, God's coming at the second coming, all of these elements, all of these, the mountains, there, I mean, there's countless more verses we could go through that talk about the uh, mountains falling into the sea and islands not existing anymore. And in Revelation 21, we see a, a new heaven and a new earth. And we, we encourage people to go into their Bibles and start reading those passages to understand there will be a restoration of all things at the end. But this existing earth won't exist anymore. The heaven that was before won't be the same. It will be a new heaven and a new earth. Just as Jesus' word said, his words, his law won't pass, but the heaven and the earth will pass, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth to start everything over with the remedy for sin completed and behind us for all of eternity. No more uh, sin problem. Now, getting back to this earth, we need to be focusing on the truth here and giving that message so people can be ready for that next earth. And part of that is knowing the truth and not being deceived into Satan's lies and being accepting of his doctrine and his purpose for this earth. We need to make sure that we are about God's purpose. So that's what this whole program is about, talking about the truth, the deception, so that you do not be deceived by his lies. And today we're going to talk about more on this, the way the individual is going to be grouped into sort of the global agenda in a seemingly innocent way. Yeah, so the the aspect we want to talk about is just one aspect of 
Satan's final worship system that will compel everyone to move into one of two camps. And just one piece of that is, as we uh, mentioned in the intro here, the role of unions. Now, uh, there are some writings in some of the books of Ellen White that we want to touch on, on how unions will play a role in the bringing about of Sunday keeping. And um, we'll read a couple of those here to just kind of paint a picture of what we're dealing with when we consider unions. I'll read the first one. It's from the book Education. It says, The centralizing of wealth and power, the vast combinations for the enriching of the few at the expense of the many, the combinations of the poor classes for the defense of their interest and claims, the spirit of unrest, of riot, and bloodshed, the worldwide dissemination of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution, all are tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. So the idea that you're going to get everybody kind of unionized, c coming together in one, and unions are a good representation of that. They're large bodies of people that act in one accord. And I think it's a very interesting point. It says the combinations of the poorer classes, which is exactly what Klaus Schwab said in the interview that we referenced last time, where he said, we want to lessen the gap between the poor and the rich. So that combination of all these into one, into a fairness, and all these other trigger words that we're referencing here. And this was written over a hundred, and uh, some of these references over 150 years ago. So this was seen coming a long time in advance. These aren't brand new things being brought up right now. And one of these other references here, this is from 1904. It says, The time is fast coming when the controlling power of the labor unions will be very oppressive. Again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions for the future, for in the future, sorry, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. This is something we've referenced before. We should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again, get out of the cities into rural districts where the houses are not crowded closely together and where you will be free from the interference of enemies. So this is talking about Revelation 13 verse 17, where it says that if you do not take the mark of the beast, that you will not be able to buy or sell. And this is very important because this is a warning that God has given his people who are studying and willing to listen to the signs that are all around us, showing the agenda that these people have, the control that they're wanting, and their end goal. And that we should take heed on that warning, get in a place where we can grow our own provisions, and not be connected to these systems that are going to be entrapping most of the people. And I'll read one more reference here. And the trades unions will be one of the agencies that will bring upon this earth a time of trouble such as never been since the world began. That was in 1903. So we see long time ago, there's a connecting connection to these unions this combination of the poor and the rich class in a time of trouble that is coming upon the world. And I think uh, there are people who watch this and say, you know, oh, throw those writings out. Uh, that That isn't worth anything to cite. I guess for those people, I would just say, log these things in the back of your mind and let them come to pass and see what happens. See if it can stand this test of time or not. Uh, because as we're going to kind of look at and go through today, when she wrote some of these in the early 1900s, uh, what's happened since that time? Have unions become a, a powerful force in the world, both politically and socially? And I think anybody who looks at it critically will say absolutely. In fact, presidents will first court in their in their nomination uh, campaigns in in getting ready for the presidential elections will first court unions 
to get uh, their votes on board because they represent large groups of people who kind of work in unison with one another. And we're going to look at, for those who say, oh, you guys are anti-union, we're not anti-union in the sense that what they were intended to do when they began. So let's look at a little bit about how unions started. I'm going to read something here from an article that will be up on uh, amazingdiscoveries.org that goes through a lot of what we talked about today in great detail and is a great source for anybody. We'll try to uh, link it down below once it's up on the site in the description. But let's look at how unions started. It says, craft unions began forming in the late 18th century in America to protect workers' income. Before industrialization, skilled workers had been independent of those who hired their skill and workers organized into unions by industry to set prices for their services. But when machines began to replace them, skilled workers were forced to exchange their time for wages set by factory owners. As industrialization dawned, there were no regulations to protect workers and reign in unscrupulous factory owners driven by rampant greed prevailed. Men, women, and children labored under inhuman conditions for meager wages that scarcely provided for their daily needs. Workers formed unions and went on strike, forcing employers to do better. So the initial concept of unions is a good one. Protect workers' wages, protect workers' conditions, and protect basic worker rights. Uh, that is not the problem that will lead to the issues in the future. It's what... Uh, fallen human nature has done with those unions in politicizing those things to move away from these concepts that are noble and move them more into a, a means to manipulate large groups of people through one central mechanism. And I think that's a important point that good motive doesn't always have a good outcome. So there's a lot of things that we talk about here that can seem good up front, worrying about the planet, all these things, uh, making sure that you have, uh, you know, uh, family time and all these things. We're not against any of those things. We're against the way that it is forced and the way that it is used for a specific agenda. And that's the issue here, is they're taking this need of uh, where was being put down unfairly on people and gave a solution that can then be manipulated in the long run to gain control again over the same individuals in the guise of helping them. Yeah. And let's look at how that kind of evolved, right? So we're, we're at this point where they're trying to establish basic worker rights and pay. Nobody's against that, especially against, again, fallen nature, the greed of factory owners. They're always going to try to increase their own profit margins. So we see that the union out of uh, need needed to be created. So let's continue. The first strike in America was by journeyman tailors in 1768. But it wasn't until almost the turn of the century that the labor movement really took off. Along with the spread of workers' unions, whose focus was mostly fair wages and working hours, the 1800s also saw a push for more extensive labor reforms through politically-minded organization like the Knights of Labor, who worked for equal rights and whose goals was a just society. Attracted by these ideals, workers from different industries joined the Knights, weakening the power of the unions whose primary focus remained fair pay. So you see here there's a transition from a rights-based focused union to this Knights of Labor, which was a politically minded organization. So, you know, almost right after they started doing these, you know, noble labor causes, you see fallen nature again comes in and starts to politicize these things, which then weaken the union's which were looking to focus primarily on worker rights and pay. So in response to the lost membership, the more politically minded Knights of Labor, trade unions representing their particular industries banded together to form the American Federation of Labor, or AFL. And it's very interesting how they use that term, just society. We see this term come up a lot, just transition, just society, these things uh, are coming up more and more and more as we delve deeper into this. 
Yeah, those are terms, just transition, decent uh, work. These are things that have specific definitions that we're going to look at a little closer. So we start to see that the workers need uh, some protection. Then shortly after these unions come about, we see this politically minded organization come through. But shortly after, we start to see how uh, England Marx, Marxism, starts using these unions to create social justice movements. So Karl Marx was able to take these unions and he was using them as a tool to overthrow capitalism. Uh, the democratic organizational structure of unions can be infiltrated to change the mindset and the focus on workers from the inside. So that's a very important point. Then when conditions are right, members can be moved to open revolution because you set it up in that way. You know, we can see through history, Marxism especially, really liked the idea of these worker labor unions as a means to shift society from kind of capitalistic uh, a mindset to a more socialistic mindset. So it acted, started to act as a vehicle, again, like the Knights of Labor, it's a politically motivated charge to, to revolutionize things for their own benefit as, as they see a particular worldview uh, as being the right worldview. In, in Marx's instance, it's communism is, is the right worldview. And they see these labor unions as a good way to, as it says, when the conditions are right, move their members towards an open revolution. And then with these unions, you lose your individuality because you have to move as a whole now. So now I'll continue here. The power of the unions rests in their ability to have members act in unison. When a decision is made, all must act together. There is no room for dissent or individualism. And unions have recourse to strong measures to ensure the compliance of its members. It's this well-organized, self-governing structure of unions that makes them so appealing and indispensable to the world's mongers. Mm -hmm. So the people who run the world know that these are good vehicles to shift whole mindsets uh, through large groups of people. Karl Marx took over leadership of the International Working Men's Association, or known as the International when it was founded in London in 1864, Ingalls, uh, Frederick Ingalls wrote of the International that its aim was to weld together into one huge army all the fighting forces of the working class of Europe and America. You know, when we listen to the papacy's social justice platform right now, it's very much focused on the poor and the working class people. Uh, this pope, the first Jesuit pope in history, has regularly been accused of skewing towards communism. Um, all of these pieces, while true, are really just positioning the pieces on the chessboard to get ready for uh, Satan's final system, this, this unification system. So it's not the pope and the UN and climate change agenda uh, looking to change the world and get everybody on board. It's they're just moving the pieces in place to create this one world system. And right now, this communistic mindset is the one that is needed to gather the pieces closer and closer together. The head of the UN was former president of Socialist International. So these are this is the worldview of these people. Uh, in the Communist Manifesto, written by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, it blatantly declares that the communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be obtained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. That sounds almost exactly like what is happening with the climate change narrative right now. We have to overthrow everything of our current lives, especially you first world nations, to uh, create this new social condition that's more inclusive and and in balance and harmony. This this is dressed up language for the communist agenda that is 
underlying most of what is the Sustainable Development Goals and Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti. Uh, it sounds great on the surface, but when you pull it apart, it's just dressed up uh, old Communist Manifesto doctrine, in essence. So what role did Marx envision that union unions would play? It says here that both Marx and Engels link the daily struggle, the struggle of the trade unions and strikes, with the struggle for class emancipation. That sounds just like liberation theology from the Jesuit, uh, South American Jesuit uh, mindset. Now, what are you liberated into, though, is the question. Because they're all about this freedom, but freedom in somehow a collective group, in a collective push. And you have to follow suit or else you are an extremist, a fundamentalist, a radical, any of these terms that are being thrown around for anybody who even thinks to question certain things that are being done. What's kind of fascinating about that to me is much of what the U.S. Constitution is based on is the individual focus. It's the individual rights, the individual liberties, the individual privacies. Uh, those things in this system are being changed for what is called the common good. Uh, and it's much the same type of mindset that, that the union has, that the larger whole is greater than the, the individual that is part of that larger whole. And that is the same global worldview as the World Economic Forum that hosts the Young Global Leaders uh, School, essentially. All of these groups want to remove the individual from the focus of these rights and liberties to the communal, the common good. Uh, which changes the nature of these things drastically. When in reality, when you have the focus on the individual, the whole will be healthier because the individual that makes it up, no matter how many you have, are living according to the individual rights, liberty, standards, morals, uh, that would make the whole more healthy. But their mindset is to create the whole, and if you have some some bad ones in, in there, throw them out or get rid of them. And now the scary part of that is how do they define which ones are the bad ones? And you'll find at the basis of that, those who believe their Bibles to be true. And these unions and other uh, mass movements give a really good opportunity to be captured by different political powers and entities. And one way that this can be done is through infiltration, correct? And that's exactly what we see happen. So Engel and Marx kind of use this, they infiltrate the, the nobility of this union to create these social justice movements. And that's in, you know, the 1860s. And then by the 1880s, we see a group called the Fabian Society. Uh, and another part of that group, Annie Besant, who's part of the Fabian Society, who's one of the I don't want to say founders of American New Age spirituality, but she is directly connected to Alice A. Bailey, who goes back to Helena Blavatsky. And before you know it, we are dealing with the Blavatsky doctrines within the Fabian Society and Annie Besant. Full-blown Satanist at this point. Yeah. Those who think that Satan is, uh, is the true God um, and the light bearer, Lucifer, the light bearer. And so this Fabian Society... They start infiltrating in the in the 1880s. We see organized labor unions and other mass movements representing opportunities for the capture of political power. They do this through infiltration, and the early one of the earliest instances of this is the Fabian Society, who were involved with unions. The Fabian Society was founded in 1884 and calls itself Britain's oldest political think tank. Again, skewing away from rights of the workers, individual workers and laborers, into more of this political mindset. It says, famous humanists who believe socialism was the answer to the world's injustices, sounds just like Pope Francis and his, his group, made up the ranks of this new society. The Fabians are also connected to the beginning of eugenics. Which we know where that leads. But in 1894... Fabian's Sidney and Beatrice Webb published The History of Trade Unionism, which supplied a rationale for the British labor movement. They introduced the term collective bargaining in 1891. See, that's fascinating because 
even today, we see that term collective bargaining used regularly. Uh, for those familiar with the sports world, the NFL, uh, Major League Baseball, basketball, their players' unions are always working on collective bargaining agreements with the owners of those organizations. So we see that that very term was born out of the Fabian Society, whose connections with Annie Besant uh, and their political ideologies push communism. And at the basis of that communism, that one grouping is a Luciferian mindset. And Annie Besant was an early leader in the New Age movement. Uh, she was a disciple of the theosophist Helena Blavatsky. Uh, Besant organized Britain's Match Girls strike in 1888, which is a very interesting date, and was later elected as president of the Indian National Congress in 1917 before traveling to the United States to present her adopted son as the reincarnation of Buddha. Now, a theosophist is basically uh, someone who's connected to um, mythical uh, understanding of God and nature and pantheism all mixed in one, which is really just Luciferianism under a different name. Well, I find it kind of strange and interesting that uh, she introduces her son as the reincarnation of Buddha. How did that turn out? <laughs> I don't think the world ended up dropping everything and, and realizing that the Buddha had, had returned in his reincarnated form. So we see the tying in. We're now beyond political uh, ideologies. And now we see the spiritual again. I mean, yep. in some of our early episodes, uh, you can go back and watch them. We connect the spirituality of the UN, which is really the spirituality of Helena Blavatsky and uh, Annie Besant and Alice A. Bailey into these political organizations, you come to find that there are a lot of people who sit on the fence spiritually these days, a lot of agnostics or atheists or just generally secular people that don't realize that these uh, political organizations also have a lot of religious connotation to them, undertones, the manifestos that they have, their working charter agreements are filled with uh, spiritual concepts that come from somewhere. And we're starting to see them tie back into Buddhism. You can see them tie back into Hinduism because you'll, you'll come to notice that there's really only two systems in the world. There's the one that worships the creator, uh, God and one that worships, as the Bible says, the God of this world, which would be uh, Lucifer. And so there isn't really a way to separate those two things, whether the individual realizes it or not. Spirituality is very much a component when dealing with all of these issues. And, and that's why we continue to see civil governments, civil issues, unions always trace back to this spiritual agenda. 100%. And that's why in the, some of the earlier podcasts, we talked about Lucis Trust and all these different societies that are directly connected with the United Nations, which should have nothing to do with religion. But it very much does because the founders of all these are very religious people and have a very religious agenda. And in the end, that New World Order isn't just going to be mono political, it'll be dual political religio power that is culminated. And uh, in Morals and Dogma, Albert Pike, very famous uh, Freemason, he says that at the end of their agenda will be the whole world worshiping Lucifer as the true God. So that is their end goal in all of this. And kind of a little hidden way of showing this is the Fabian Society logo, its coat of arms, is a wolf in sheep's clothing. I thought that was so funny. You, you can't make this stuff up. No. So let's continue in history. Now we're in the kind of the 1880s. Now let's see what Russia did and Lenin in using unions to create this Russian revolution in 1917. It says trade unions prepared the working classes for revolutions. And we're going to see this is this is constantly the uh, 
the mechanism used to create class revolution. Says Georgi Dmitriev, who be later became Bulgaria's first communist leader, explained the task of the unions like this, quote, we have to have a struggle waged by the whole proletariat, which it will terminate with arms in hand. To rally the masses, to educate and prepare them for this struggle is today the foremost task of the trade unions. So you see That's right That's a there. pretty bold statement. <laughs> yeah. The conclusion... <laughs> Preparing the world for these revolutions by using trade unions. Yeah, exactly. Bringing them all together to a point where you can eventually have some physical pushback. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what the word proletariat even means? So that is very interesting because it actually is a word in Latin and it means the maker of offspring. So basically that's the only thing you're good for is just making children. And in ancient Rome, uh, a proletarii uh, were people who were so poor that the only form of property that they had was their own children to be used as soldiers. So that's where that term comes from. Very derogatory, very base that uh, they're using this in a sense to gain all these people who basically they're saying are no good but to make children together in an agenda that they want to end up pushing from an inside agenda. So it was Lenin who exploited unionism to realize his goals for the Russian Revolution of 1917. Here's a quote that says, it was the unions and shop committees which furnished and formed the frame of the workers' columns, which made the October or Russian Revolution, wrote the Bolshevik revolutionary Solomon Abramovich Lazovsky in 1920. Okay, so we've gone from the mid 18 uh, the 18th century into the 1800s. So the 1700s into the 1800s. Now we're into the early 1900s, and we see that now communism has spread in a lot of the world. And in large part, it's been done through the use of worker trade unions. And this, this was is set up. just simply history. Yeah, this is history. This is set up 100 years ago. So those quotes we were reading in 1904, 1903, that was just before this. And now we see it really full blown in kind of a, a in action play here. It's not just theory anymore. It's actually being put to use. And and how much of the workers' rights and the pay uh, basis is still there anymore? It's it's pretty much gone. Like, yes, it's still there in window dressing, but it's now full-blown political uh, movements, social movements that have the promises of better wages and better conditions and all of these things, but the the vehicle is no longer about that. It is now full on for the use by uh, power hungry, uh, fallen human natured people to manipulate and create out of uh, the ashes these social justice movements that leads to a lot of as we said, war and bloodshed. But how does the papacy kind of come into all of this? Because we know the papacy is kind of front and center, always in the prophetic lens. And when we go back and look at papal encyclicals, Catholic social teachings, all of these very important uh, doctrine, we kind of start to see that they also have this same worldview regarding trade unions. In fact, in 1891, Pope Leo XIII published his very famous encyclical, Reverum Novorum, meaning new things. So set against the societal upheavals brought on by the Industrial Revolution, his encyclical expresses the foundational principles of Catholic social teachings, including the common good, something that people are getting very used to hearing now, yep. the universal destination of goods, which is in essence uh, that the individual doesn't have the right to goods, that the, the dissemination of goods worldwide is based on the common good, not wealth. on your means of having or not having. Solidarity and subsidiarity, the idea that matters should be dealt with at the most local level possible. 
So the way to do this, the Pope said, was by forming associations, especially trade unions. He felt that unions were, quote, greatly to be desired and that they should become more numerous and more efficient. So that's very interesting. So now we see that connection again to the religious system and that specific religious system that we've been talking about the entire time on the podcast as going to be that final push. And even more than that, something that Pope Leo said is we must pay special and chief attention to the duties of religion and morality. So religion coming in extremely heavy again and morality. That's something that we've been talking about. Not surprisingly, he advised, let the working man be urged and led to the worship of God, to the earnest practice of religion, and, among other things, to the keeping holy of Sundays and holy days. Let him learn to reverence and love holy church, the common mother of us all, and hence to obey the precepts of the church. According to Rerum Navarum, unions can never focus solely on secular interests, but must serve the interest of the church. So we can see that going right into Sunday worship. Yeah, the, the crossover is happening, and it's happening back in the late 1800s, right? The papacy, you can just take common good and tr an equal sign and put communism, because common good and communism are essentially the same thing. And when you break that down, the reason the papacy likes the trade unions so much is because it gives them a framework to get this whole group of people to, as it says, love and reverence the church the mother, the common mother of us all, and to obey the precepts of the church. So with the focus of the Catholic worship day, of Sunday. So the crossover is happening. The papacy sees and accepts this mechanism as an adequate vehicle to bring about the world's acceptance of Sunday and its pagan-natured holy days, including Easter and Christmas, Valentine's Day. These are all inventions of the papacy to account for their pagan holy days. Marking Rare Navarum's 40th anniversary in 1931, Pius's Quadrismo Anno, reconstructing of the social order, expanded upon the church's plan for this restructuring. This included the recruitment and training of, quote, auxiliary soldiers of the church, to be, quote, apostles to the workers, and for the Catholic associations to be formed alongside secular labor unions to zealously engage in imbuing and forming their members so that they in turn may be able to permeate the unions. So the idea is they're going to infuse, they're going to go alongside these secular unions and infuse them with these Catholic social doctrines. And do we see uh, an emphasis here on people reverencing the Bible or specifically just the church and the church doctrines? Because that's two very different things. Because the Catholic Church says that tradition, the Catholic Church tra tradition is overarching the Bible. I even have family members that are Catholic and they say the difference between you and me is that you believe the Bible and the Bible alone. I believe the Bible and tradition and tradition overrides the Bible, which is exactly the point in the Catholic Church and the Catholic movement, is that their traditions are over and above the Bible and the Scripture, which, of course, for us, it is not that. The Bible is above everything else because it is the only word of God that we should be following. Yeah, and, and I can't I can't blame the papacy for taking this angle. It's a pretty clever angle to go about uh, infusing, especially in a Protestant nation, infusing Catholic social teachings in a place that historically has been very well aware of the papacy's history and the outcomes of their doctrine, which in the end removes the divinity of Christ as the only mediator and his blood alone as the atoning uh, cleansing for sacrifice for sin. 
Now, people may try to say, well, these are all old, old doctrines. Uh, these are mindsets that probably don't still exist to this day. I'd like to pull us way forward now into June of 2021. Pope Francis addresses the United Nations International Labor Organization at the 109th conference. His message was an urgent call to action. Seems to be the name of the game these days, urgent, fear-based calls to action. And he said at this conference, this conference has been convened at a crucial moment in social and economic history. I'll just pause quickly right there. Why is a pope who's just supposed to be the head of a church, even though we know he's the king of a monarchy, but most people only think he's just the head of a church, why is he talking about social and economic history at all? Uh, shouldn't he be sticking to the scriptures and telling people to come closer to God? And But here he's going out into a public civil forum and instantly leading his talk by focusing on the social and economic aspects of the current climate. He continues and says that the time has come to eliminate inequalities. So we're going to get rid of all inequalities now. And according to him, to cure the injustice that is undermining the health of the entire human family. Now, we're going to continue on here, but this kind of sounds like what Marx and Engels did, right? They kind of got the working class together and said, we're going to eliminate your inequalities. We're going to close that gap between those rich factory owners and, and you, the worker. We're going to eliminate the injustices and, and help your health. This is very typical communist language when you start looking at how these worker revolutions get on board. The people don't uh, get fooled by uh, being talked to with this straight language, meaning they're not coming and saying, hey, we're going to use you guys to create this worker revolution and you should be on board with that. That's not that how they approach these things. They approach him with saying, we're going to alleviate all of your issues. We're going to eliminate all those bad things. And we're going to bring in all these good things. But it never works out as such, ever. Well, it, it, it does work out in the way that they are wanting. It doesn't work out for the people in the way that the people understand it. And that goes back to one of our first podcasts. We were talking about the book 2052 because... In that book, their agenda, and that's from the Club of Rome, is that everybody will have their basic income, their house, their everything. Everything will be the same. So you don't have to be jealous. You don't have to feel, you know, that there's inequality between individuals. And we'll just make everything nice, hunky-dory, perfect world, which is actually very imperfect because... Our differences is what make us individuals. If we all acted the same, it'd be very boring. You could predict everyone's sentences even. But the point is that God created people to have their own choices and decisions, or else we're just all robots, which evidently is is kind of what they're going for in a sense. Yeah, I mean, Christ died for the individual to have the right to choose. God could have gotten rid of free will uh, from the beginning, but he didn't. In fact, he's done everything to uphold free will, even if the individual doesn't choose him. Uh, he still upholds the right to the individual to think and choose for themselves. Uh, that is not the way that Lucifer's structure is set up. But let's go back to Pope Francis here. <clears throat> he basically tells this Un United Nations International Labor Organization that this is a historical phase in Earth's history, and is the opportunity of reordering society's wreckage left in the wake of COVID-19. So now we had this pandemic, right, that has created this wonderful opportunity. Well, where have we heard that before? That sounds kind of like Klaus Schwab's narrative. COVID-19 has created this wonderful opportunity to reshape society. So here's some other statements from the same speech, where Pope Francis says, it is time to permanently free ourselves of the legacy of enlightenment. This is the task at hand for unions now to get rid of this legacy of enlightenment. So what is this term, the legacy of enlightenment? Well, let's define this for everybody. It says that the legacy of enlightenment is an ethically neutral state, or one could say separation of church and state. 
As a result of this ethically neutral state is the unjust marginalization of religious from civil life, meaning you can't have these two pieces separate. That's, that's, that's not good. We need to bring these things back together. It continues on. It says it seems from this statement that a more just society would be one in which religion plays more of a central role in civil life. Yeah. Which is the hallmark of the Dark Ages. You have the religious and the political under the same roof, giving the same orders. And how's that worked out in history there, Mackenzie? Well, when we look at the, the Dark Ages, it didn't turn out too good. And it wasn't dark because the sun didn't come up. That's not why they called it the Dark Ages. It was dark because the rights in, of the individual were completely non-existent and the light of the Word of God was completely removed and the papacy stood between man and their true intercessor, Jesus you Christ. You weren't allowed to read the Bible. The Bible was chained and it was in Latin, so you couldn't even understand it. So you had to go to the priest and he had to tell you what God was t saying to you. You couldn't go to Jesus, the intercessor, which is, we believe, our direct intercessor that we can speak to whenever we need to. So now, how is that relevant for what we're talking about and this idea of the ethically neutral state? So this comes from uh, the Protestant Reformation, which broke out in the 16th century. Uh, it challenged the authority of the church in all aspects of society, asserting the people were ultimately and individually accountable to God, which is exactly opposite of what was happening back then. This started a process of emancipation from the church, control that progressed through the events of the Enlightenment. Secularism and atheism were both results of this. But so was the separation of church and state. So we have these different uh, f fractions being broken off here. The authority of the church was grossly undermined by the Reformation and the Enlightenment. Enlightenment. The church lost control over the state and civil matters, and the state declared itself ethic ethically neutral. Is this the legacy from which we must permanently free ourselves. And interestingly enough, Henry Kissinger said, and we referenced this before, that the Reformation was one of the biggest hindrances to the New World Order because it separated that church from state and gave the control back to the individual of their own salvation and their own life. So here we are in this speech in 2021, where the Pope, using communistic language dressed up in the form of workers' rights and benefits for the health and family and all these things, come in and basically says, we need to get rid of the separation of church and state. That's decoding the language here. Then we find out that this whole ethically neutral state that he wants to get rid of comes from the Protestant Reformation. In essence, the Jesuits, who were created to destroy they were created to be a counter-reformation. Now that Jesuit Pope is continuing that work in trying to destroy the work of the Reformation to bring back what it once had, which is this power of unification of church and state. And this is, through these trade unions, the mindset that they're trying to instill. But unfortunately, a lot of those good people in those unions are unaware of the level of uh, deception and um, the focus that is to change their mindsets, to think that the things that they're fighting for right now, better wages, better working conditions, four-day work weeks, which we'll come and look at here in a second, are all for their own good. And here they're being manipulated to uh, create the conditions for what will be the elimination, eventual elimination of this ethically neutral state or the removal of church-state separation, and in that, the common good being established amongst that. So you're basically taking the Constitution of the United States and throwing it off to the side. The individual is now gone. The separation of church and state is now gone in, in the eventual, what the Bible calls the deadly wound B, 
being healed. Yeah. This is all the healing of that wound as we speak, talking about bringing these two things back together when they do, which they will be successful in this goal. When they bring those two things back together, the conditions of the dark ages will, in its modern form, uh, come about again. So the transition that we're seeing over time, as much as it seems about civil issues, we can see here the papacy is well aware of how to use these mechanisms they, how they've been used in the past, and what ultimately the goal of their manipulation within those unions are, which is to bring about a unification of church and state. And that's why back in the 1600s, and even a little bit earlier, when the Reformation happened, they had already had the New World Order plan, and they were getting very close to the fulfillment of that, which was the Dark Ages, where the church was ruling the government. And then the Reformation happened, and they need to get back to that spot that they were 500 years ago. So let's let's continue to look at some of these statements that the Pope made at this international labor organization that is the United Nations uh, organization. And it says the Pope's message to the ILO was his concern for the common good or communism. (laughs) He called on the ILO to continue to exercise special care for the common good and called for religious unity, saying that for the sake of the common good, it is also essential that all confessions and religious communities work hard together. I find that really fascinating because if you were to ask those union members, what was the definition of of common good that Pope Francis used. How many do you think would know what definition of common good he's using? Very little of them. I would imagine that most of them would come up with their own definition of common good and say, well, that's pretty much what I think he meant. But the term common good has been used for hundreds of years inside of encyclicals. This is not a new term. And essentially it is, is the universal destination of goods, the concept that the, the, the whole is greater than the individual that needs to be uh, uplifted uh, rather than the ind- rights of the individual. All of these pieces create this idea that the common good is not what you and I would think it is. Do we want the co- general common good for people? Sure, absolutely. Do we want the definition of common good by the papacy as they use it in, in these and all other historical cases? Not a chance. That is, as you said, leads back to the conditions of the Dark Ages. And as the Bible shows in Revelation 13, the deadly wound will be healed. It will get back to the state of united church and state power that it once had, Absolutely. along with other powers to to help it along, namely the United States of America. And that is then connected back to the 2030 Agenda. So then the Pope asked the this international labor organization to understand work correctly. So he's saying you need to understand the definition of what work really means regarding the decent work agenda, part of the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Decent work, quote unquote, is also enshrined as sustainable development goal number eight. So let's take a look at these terms really quick. What decent work is and what things like just transition is in this papal definition of things. We see that the term decent work was introduced in 1999 by the International Label Organization, the exact group that he's talking to now, and embraces, amongst other things, rest days protected by law. Gee, I wonder what day of rest would be protected by law or what they're going for nowadays. (laughs) In accordance with the decent work agenda in 2014 was the creation of the European Sunday Alliance, a coalition of various trade unions, civil society organizations, and religious communities to launch a pledge for work-free Sundays. There's the religious part being brought in once again, by these labor associations. And you can see, you can go to the website, the European Sunday Alliance, I think it's .org, we'll put the the link down below. But the European Sunday Alliance is aimed at committing European politicians to promote 
a common weekly day of rest. You know, I wasn't raised Adventist. I haven't been Adventist as long as many have, but I came to understand this Sunday issue and it acted as like this mark in my mind to see how the world is reacting to this Sunday narrative. And the further we get along through history, the more prevalent this Sunday becomes. It's almost like you can't avoid it. And there are people I've talked to, secular friends, who's like, you know, we, why does anybody care about a day? But here, Adventists have for hundreds of years now, about 150 years, been talking about Sunday as this major issue. And that it could have been so easy for this not to be so prevalent and to have that be written off and be ridiculed because nothing ever came of it. Yet, whether it's the blue laws or now we're seeing more and more climate Sundays, radical justice Sundays, common day of rest Sundays, European Sunday Alliance, Sunday is becoming very much front and center in how the world will resolve a lot of their injustices, as Pope Francis put it. And I don't think people really understand how big these unions are and how many people are actually involved in these unions. Now, when we look at a group called the International Trade Union Confederation. This is the world's largest uh, trade union. The ITUC represents 200 million workers in 163 countries and territories and has 332 national affiliates. This is a large uh, organization. It's, it's, it's incredible when you really think about the numbers. You've got... 1.3 some odd billion Catholics who keep Sunday no problem. You've got Protestant churches across the world who keep Sunday no problem. Now you've got 200 million workers who are part of one organization. And I'm sure they're made up. There's Catholics in there and, and Protestants, but there's also a lot of secular people in there for a secular organization. And in one fell swoop, as soon as you get that one organization to adopt something, at least in principle, all their members have to be behind it. Otherwise, the yeah. solidarity of the union starts to break down. And you have 200 million people in 163 countries wrapped up in one organization. Is that centralization of power ripe for corruption, greed, manipulation? Absolutely. And they'll be pushed into even if they don't want to, that just transition. And this just transition, it's a very interesting term. Uh, it is a principle, a process, and a practice. The principle of just transition is that a healthy economy and a clean environment can and should coexist. The process of achieving this vision should be a fair one that should not cost workers or community residents their health, environment, jobs, or economic assets, which comes across seeming very good on the surface. So there's these two terms, decent work and just transition. These are not terms that most average people will come to know. But what is it essentially is dealing with is Decent work is you don't have to work on Sunday. And just transition, although it's been used for a while now, is really being baked into this idea of climate change, climate legislation, climate disclosure. In fact, we're seeing uh, these movements like the Climate Justice, Justice Alliance is all for this concept of just transition. And we see that they have these concepts that allow them to put at the front of uh, what they are pushing Sunday and wrap it up in worker rights movements, social justice movements. But in the at the basis of them is this papal agenda of the common good and Sunday rest. These are all based in Catholic social principles. A lot of it is based in liberation theology, which is the, the active liberation of the poor. Mm -hmm. And it's against those who uh, are rich or in, in even in this case, a lot of middle class people would be considered uh, in that rich class. They want to pull everything down into the poor and they want to get the 
poor nations and the and the poverty stricken people up in arms. And there's a lot of good natured people who I'm not saying everyone in these uh, in these marches or these groups are uh, for this papal agenda. But neither were those who were used in the Marxist revolutions of these trade unions or the Lenin revolutions of these trade unions. They're being used. They're being manipulated. And they, they don't understand it, even though the causes that they're supporting are, are good causes. Of course, we want the planet to be taking as good a care of as possible. But even if we do, we're not going to get rid of the poor. Poverty will still exist. And the end, those Bible verses that we read, of the, the end of verse history will still remain the same. There is no changing uh, those pieces. And I think it's kind of not coincidental because <laughs> these things are all working in such harmony. But just recently, California proposed a new law for a four-day to mandate, possibly mandate, four-day work weeks. We're seeing pilot programs in the United States and Canada for four-day work weeks. We're seeing Amazon workers and Starbucks workers working to unionize right now. Now, people will say, "That's why is that any big deal? But when you see that this has been at the core of this just transition and decent work agenda, and we know where that agenda comes from and what the true nature of it is, all of these things are pushing towards the final adoption of a universal Sunday rest. These are all tools that are being used, used a hundred, over a hundred years ago and connected with Marxism, socialism, communism, all these things to basically remove capitalism, remove individuality, remove all these things, go to a common good. And the funny thing is they referenced you not having a shift or a change in your daily life. Now, that's very interesting because their whole premise is you will own nothing and be happy. So if there is no change, you own nothing to owning nothing. Well, there is no change. <laughs> but that's not how most people understand it because they don't see the whole picture. They don't see how these unions will be used in the way that they will to bring about this new world order, this Sunday law push that'll put people in a very difficult situation if everything now is unionized. And we've seen how in the past couple of years that from the top down, they can determine what your moral compass is directing to and that you can be uh, punished or have implications because you have a difference in your ideology, which is exactly what they're going for here. And one common thread, just like a quick point to kind of show people how interconnected these things are, universal basic income, UBI, this is going to become a thing all over the world. Yeah. It hasn't yet, but we've seen pilot programs launched all over the place. On Canada's own universal basic income, like promotional website to get people behind this, <clears throat> they have a goal that says they want to create this universal basic income program to end all poverty. If you go to the sustainable development goals, you'll see one of those goals is end all poverty. If you go into Laudato C, one of the central points of the whole document is to end all poverty. I'll say what I said at the beginning. Jesus' own words was, the poor will be with you always. How do those two statements coexist? If we put all this effort into ending something that Jesus says will never end, what is that actually going to account for then? The falling away of wealth, individual rights, individual privacy, everything that made up the lamb-like principles, uh, let's say, of the United States will be done away with. And it is all in an effort to solve something that will never get solved, to stop an outcome that cannot be stopped. Yeah. And in the end, what we're really dealing with across the board, everything we're talking about here, focuses on Catholic social teachings and Sunday rest. This is the basis. In fact, um, we'll see one of the statements, prophetic statements from the book Great Controversy, is that when Roman principles come under care and protection of the state, 
That is when the image of the beast will be formed and national ruin will shortly follow. So we're going to see that these Catholic social teachings will ultimately make up the basis for uh, this coming image of the beast system. Now, let's quickly take a look at a couple of these Sunday rest concepts that are infused with Catholic social teachings. It says, uh, whatever shape the new world of work will take in the near future will be promoted as being for the common good and for the saving of the earth because Sunday legislation is touted as this cure-all for almost every earthly malady. That's exactly what's happening right now. It's been marketed as a COVID antidote, a worker's necessity, a cure from selfishness, a remedy for an ailing economy, the source of strength for families, a, quote, revitalizing life tonic, and a tech Shabbat to help the wired generation reconnect with real life. Honestly, it would be a, a huge mistake to underestimate the influence of Catholic social teachings in the world today. You see everything from uh, groups like the Common Good Foundation, which is actually headed by a, a, a Jewish man, found that the Catholic social teachings is what brought about the liberation of issues during uh, uh, World War II. In fact, he states it was Catholic social teachings that was responsible for the restructuring of German society after World War II. It's Catholic, to so it's Catholic social teachings that permeate the popular movements today. It is the basis of the faith of seven of nine Supreme Court justices. People will say it's six of nine, but Neil Gorsuch is listed as Anglican Catholic and studied with a Catholic philosopher for a long time. So Catholic social teachings get familiar with what is uh, in there. In fact, we may do an episode just reviewing Catholic social teachings, common good, universal destinations of good, the idea of private property are all in these Catholic social teachings. And now our president, our Supreme Court, our labor unions, uh, and our, even our Protestant churches are adopting slowly but surely the mindsets of the papacy through social justice movements uh, and things like um, Sunday rest initiatives. And, you know, we have nothing to fear for the future unless we forget how we were led in the past and the experiences we had in the past, which history is something that not a lot of people know nowadays. Even when you talk about things 70 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. People know very little about our real history and what has been taking place. But we need to realize those things that happened in the past, accept them and apply them now because the agenda hasn't changed. And they've been very clear the agenda hasn't changed. The devil's agenda hasn't changed. And these world elites agenda hasn't changed. That push from the low class, the high class, into one uh, group of people. That's how they want to get rid of world poverty. Because if everybody has the same, even if everybody becomes poor, you're not poor anymore. Because everybody's equal. It goes back to the lords and the serfs. And you basically become a slave to the system. But as Jesus said, uh, there's nothing to fear. Fear him who can destroy the, the body and the soul in hell. Um, these uh, people who are doing these things, we are to pray for them, to pray for the individuals, to uh, hope that God can touch their heart uh, and be converted. While the outcome can't change, the love that we display, uh, that, that, that our Savior had for us, that we display to others, will be the marked contrast as there becomes, as we move closer to the end of verse history, two marked class of people, those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus and those who receive the mark of the beast. Um, while we continue on this journey of truth, we hope that you all found something interesting, something educating in this, something that we can look to and see what's going to come in the future, what role unions play. Uh, we uh, pray for all those uh, people who are part of unions to uh, not be deceived, to see what is happening and why, and to be able to pull yourselves from it before we are too unprepared uh, and that time of no buy, no sell comes. 
Uh, but remember that our Lord comes like a thief in the night, that our goal should be to draw nearer to him and do all we can to uh, uplift uh, that uh, saving uh, blood of Jesus to all who will listen and, and come close to the Savior before the close of time. Thank you, Mackenzie, for your time today. Um, Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. 